One of the things we need to do in ministering to others, especially in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, is to serve others. That's what I want to talk to you about this this morning, is striving for effective service. The Apostle Paul began his missionary work when the church at Antioch was told by the Holy Spirit to set aside Barnabas and Saul, as Paul was known in those days, and to send them on their first missionary journey. That journey would take them to the island of Cyprus and then up into Asia Minor, where they would go to the towns of Antioch, Presidia, and Iconian, and Lystra, and Derbe, and um, Perga. Um, these were the years 48 and 49. The two men preached God's word, saw lives changed, planted churches, and saw those churches begin to grow. In A.D. 50, Paul was ready to go on another missionary journey. His companion on the first missionary journey, Barnabas, wanted to take John Mark with them. But Paul refused because John Mark had had left, had, had quit them on the first missionary journey. So Paul chose Silas, uh, Barnabas took John Mark, and they went in different directions. Paul and Silas went into Asia Minor to go back to the same churches that they had established um, in what is today modern Turkey. When they reached the town of Lystra, they met or possibly renewed a friendship with a young man named Timothy. Not really sure either way. Um, but they were, um, they did build this relationship. Now, Timothy agreed to leave his home and to follow Paul and Silas on their missionary journey. And neither men knew it at the time, but they were, were both beginning a 20-year relationship or almost 20 years during this third missionary journey Paul spent three years in the city of Ephesus those were the years of 54 through 57 his ministry in Ephesus was fruitful uh, he preached God's word faithfully and saw people one to faith in Christ but eventually the Holy Spirit told Paul and his um, team, if you will, to go or to prepare to go somewhere else. And this is when they had the Macedonian vision to, to go over to Macedonia and help them. Now, if you um, can remember in your mind, Greece, it, it's got the northern part there that's kind of horizontal, and then the, the peninsula on the western side. Macedonia was that northern area on the eastern side. And this is where Paul and his missionary team went. Um, he would send Timothy ahead into Macedonia, and when they caught up, he would send Paul or Timothy again into other towns to kind of scout out the situation and look for, you know, see what the opportunities were to preaching God's word. Paul's missionary journey ended when he. Uh, went to Jerusalem at the end of the third missionary journey. It was about AD 58. Um, in Jerusalem, Paul was arrested because there was a riot about to happen because Paul had been preaching salvation by faith alone through Christ alone, and the crowds didn't like that in Jerusalem. So Paul was um, put in chains, taken down to Caesarea on the, the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, Paul would spend a couple of years in jail in Caesarea and finally he would appeal to Caesar which was his right as a Roman citizen and so he was taken by ship to um, well, almost all the way to Turkey or to uh, excuse me Italy. Um, they had the shipwreck there and they had to change ships as you know uh, that story. Paul's trial before um, Caesar is not recorded for us in the scriptures. We don't know fully the outcome of that 
uh, trial. Um, we surmise from a few possible areas that um, Paul was freed at some point after the trial, but he would later be arrested a second time, and in about A.D. 64, um, would lose his life. Paul's mentoring of his relationship with Timothy would change that man's life forever. Think about that lady that we saw the, the video. Granted, she's an actress and it was written by a, you know, a script writer. But imagine how her life would change if somebody did introduce her to the Lord Jesus Christ. But this is what was going on with Timothy. Second Timothy, where our text is today, is the last book that Paul would write that is in our New Testament. Um, he encourages Timothy to remain strong in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I would encourage you as well. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in his grace. Paul begins our passage by giving Timothy four images from everyday life of what it means to be effective in service. And then he gives Timothy three truths that promote effective service. And I pray that you would listen to the Lord as you listen to me this morning. I want to begin with the four images of effective service. And the first image is that of an effective teacher. Look with me at verses 1 and 2. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. If the Christian faith is to survive in any location, Christians must do what Paul is instructing Timothy to do in verse 2. We must pass on to faithful men what Paul had passed on to Timothy and then pass that on to other men. Kind of a domino effect, if you will. All right? What Paul's saying here in verse 2 is that Paul taught Timothy how to grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, how to, to grow in his faith, how to, how to learn to pray, how to read the Bible and all those other things. And he's telling Timothy, the things you have heard me that I have passed on to you, Timothy, I want you to pass those same things on to other people who will also be able to pass them on to still other people who will then pass it on to other people. What I'm talking about here is called church growth by multiplication. What a lot of churches do is church growth by arithmetic, by addition. We, we win a person to faith over here and baptize them. We win somebody over here to faith and by, baptize them and praise God for every single person who comes to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But I'll tell you, church growth by addition is never going to sustain a church. And the reason for that should be obvious to, to us. People move away. People die. Uh, there's reasons why people Stop coming to a church. And if we are trying to replace or to grow our church by replacing the people who go out the back door with one or two that come in the front door, our church is never going to thrive. We're never going to really grow. What we have to do is what Paul is saying here in verse 2 is what he's telling Timothy is we've got to grow our church by multiplication. Imagine, if you will, one person who's teaching three or four or five people, and each one of those three or four or five people, after 
the, the teaching time is over with, is able to teach themselves each four or five more people. That's what multiplication is. That's what Paul is telling Timothy to do. That's what I'm telling us to do. We have to be willing to, to grow our church by multiplication. Now what that means is we need godly men and women who are willing to faithfully teach God's word and to teach what it means to, to be part of the Christian faith. But it also means that you, ladies and gentlemen, need to be part of that growth as well because we've got to have somebody to, to, to teach. Um, Brother Mike and Brother P Sister Pam, Sunday school teachers, imagine their class if nobody showed up. They wouldn't have much of a lesson for that day, would they? And that's true for every single class. If we do not bring the word of God with us and go into the church, to the Sunday school classrooms or the classrooms on Sunday nights or the classrooms on Wednesday mornings or Tuesday evenings or whenever and sit at the feet of men and women who are more mature than we are and learn from them and then take that on and teach others, then we're not doing our job as a church. It's just simple, just that simple. The second image of an effective service is that of an effective soldier. Look with me at verse 3 and 4. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in the concerns of civilian life. He is seeking to please the commanding officer. Now, if you have ever worn your nation's uniform, you already know what I'm about to talk about here because you understand the suffering that takes place when you put on um, the soldier's uniform, the Marine's uniform, the Airmen or Coast Guard or what, Navy, whatever it is. Think about the, the men who were forced marched in the uh, Bataan Death March in the Philippines. Think about the men who charged across the beaches of Omaha um, in order to attack Nazi Germany. They understand the suffering that takes place when you wear your nation's uniform. Well, Paul is instructing Timothy that part of a effective service is the willingness to suffer. Now, we don't like to do that. We don't want to suffer. We want everything to just be roses. And as John Denver used to sing, the sunshine on my shoulder, you know, and all that fun stuff. Let me tell you something. When you take a stand for Jesus Christ, you're going to suffer. Your family's going to stop inviting you over for dinner. Your friends are not going to be friends much longer because you are living a different kind of life. Now take care, my friends, that you do not pull away from them. All right? One thing, they pull away from you, but don't you pull away from them because you've got the message. Remember that video we just saw? We've got the message of eternal life that we have to share with people. Sadly, some Christians try to walk on both sides of the fence. We try to, to live the godly life, you know, on Sundays on one side of the fence, and then we try to step on the other side of the fence, and we want to live like the world for a while. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, that kind of a lifestyle will not um, bring joy and peace to your life. You're not going to be pleasing God, you're not going to be pleasing the world when you try to live like the other side. The only answer to this failed lifestyle is what Paul tells us here in verse 4, when he says, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in the concerns of the civilian life. In other words, seek to please your commanding officer. Who's our commanding officer? Jesus, God, however you want to say it. Yeah, exactly. And let me tell you something. When you're pleasing God, he'll supply the joy. He'll supply the peace. But when you're not seeking to please the Lord, yeah, you can figure out the rest. The third image 
of effective service is the effective athlete. Look at verse 5. Also, in other words, Paul's continuing his um, discussion here. If anyone competes as an athlete, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. You know, we live in an age, sadly enough, that you get a trophy if you just participate. And I'm not here to tell you, folks, you don't get into heaven by simply participating in church. You've got to have a relationship with the Lord. It's just that simple. You know, the whole idea of athletics is to compete, to strive for victory. Not everyone is going to be the winner. There's going to be kids that will lose. But they need to learn how to do that. Now, that's chasing a rabbit there. In the 1988 Summer Olympics, it was held in Seoul, South Korea. The American sprinter Carl Lewis was racing against the Canadian Ben Johnson in the 100-meter finals. There were six other guys, but the race was between those two men. Johnson won that race with a time of nine seconds, 9.79 seconds. I can't even stand up that fast. I can't imagine running 100 yards. Lewis came in second with a time of 9.92 seconds. But it was learned three days later that, Carl, or that Ben Johnson had taken steroids. And that is a violation of the rules. So the gold medal that he was awarded was taken away from him and given to Carl Lewis because Lewis competed according to the rules. Um, we who compete, we compete according to these rules. All right? I can tell you right now how we can pack this out, this worship center out in one month. I mean, people standing in the hallways, standing along the outside. All we got to do is go back to passing out bulletins and put a $20 bill in every bulletin. I guarantee you, word will spread and people will come by the hundreds to get that $20 bill. But that's not the way God wants us to grow a church. He wants us to go out into the highways and byways, to go to our neighbors and our family and to tell people about Jesus Christ and to invite them to give their lives to Christ. And yes, Sister Pam, we are going to continue to emphasize evangelism in 2025 and beyond. Maybe not as a theme like we're doing right now, but we're going to continue to challenge ourselves and you in order to tell people about Jesus. The fourth image of an effective service is that of a farmer. Look at verse 6. It says, The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to get a share of the crops. You know, that word hardworking is a Greek verb meaning to labor to the point of exhaustion. You know, a lot of us work jobs where you know, we clock in at, say, 8 or 9 o'clock, and we clock out at 4 or 5 o'clock in, you know, in the afternoon, whatever that might be. Some of you do, some of you don't. I'm getting a few nods there. Yeah, I get that. Let me tell you about The farmer doesn't have you know, a, a time clock that he punches. He has to work from sunup to sundown and sometimes beyond that. And when it's winter time, and the crops in the fall have already been brought in, his job is not over with. He continues to, to work mending fences and digging up rocks and whatever else it is that they do. And we cannot think that we can labor lightly and be effective in our service to God. We must labor to the point of exhaustion if we w will. All right? Um, the challenge of farmers was the delayed knowledge that their crop was going to come in. You know, 
they plant the crop in the spring or whenever is appropriate. They don't know if the rains are going to come in order to, to grow the crops. They don't know if, you know, heat's going to wilt, wilt the plants. They don't know if bugs are going to come in. They don't know if they got a bad batch of seeds to begin with. They don't know. What they do is they prepare the soil, they plant the seed, they tend the soil, and then they wait on God to send the rain. They wait on God to send the sunshine. They wait on God. An effective farmer realizes only at the end of the, the growing period whether or not he's been successful. And we don't know for a fact that 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 person that you led to faith in Christ last week is truly a Christian. It's possible they were just trying to get you to leave them alone. <laughs> and it's not until we enter into glory and we're going to have people come up to us and say, thank you. that You gave your money for the Harvest Festival. Thank you that you volunteered during Vacation Bible School. Thank you that you served in your church and in your community in such a way that I was able to place my faith in Jesus Christ and I'm now here in glory along with you because of your effective service. What a celebration that's going to be. I don't get to see my family very often anymore. I talk to my brother on the phone uh, once or twice a month just see how things are going. But I can't wait to see mom and dad again, to see my grandparents again. I never knew my maternal grandfather. Died before I was born. But by my testimony of my mom, he loved the Lord Jesus and he's in glory. And I can't wait to meet him. What a celebration we're going to have. Now Paul gives those four testimonies four examples of what it means to serve, all right? But then he says this, and I want you to look with me at verse 7. He says, consider what I say. Now he's talking to Timothy, but he's also talking to us. So he's saying to you and to me today, consider what Paul's saying. For the Lord will give you understanding in everything. How do we apply these truths? Well, what we need to do is sit down and be still. And let the Lord speak to us. That's not easy to do in modern America. We are, go, 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 go. We go to you know, fast food drive through to get our meals and to, to go about our day. There's so many things we're, we're trying to accomplish in our to-do list. To sit still and to listen to God is a lost art by many Americans. But this is what Paul's telling Timothy to do. And I'm telling you and even myself, we need to slow down and we need to let God speak to us. We need to ask him, how does God see my service, your service in his kingdom? If you're pleasing to the Lord, he'll tell you. But if you're not serving, if you're not helping People come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. He'll tell you that also. We need to consider these words of Paul and let the Holy Spirit speak to us. Now Paul then offers three truths that promote effective service. And the first one is this, that we all need a proper understanding of Christ. Look with me at verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead and descended from David, according to my gospel. Now, all of us are to serve God. 
every single, excuse me, every single one of us are to be servants. Maybe you can't get down on the floor like you used to when you were younger. I get that. No, no, not a problem. There's other ways to serve. But the example of our service is Christ. And Paul is saying here, remember Jesus Christ. You know, as we reflect on Jesus' service, we tend to forget the fact that he both served us while at the same time being the second person of the Trinity, the Son of the living God. You know, if Jesus, well, let me say it this way, if there was ever anybody who was worthy of being served, it was Jesus. But that's not why he came. In Matthew 28, or excuse me, Matthew 20, verses 16 through 28. No, nope, that's not right. Verse 18. All right, my notes are all messed up here. But here's what Jesus says. I know I got this part right. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. For just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So if you want to be a leader in this congregation, be a servant of this congregation. Put the needs of other people ahead of your own need. Be a servant. And if you want to rise above being a servant, that means being a slave. You know, a servant clocks out at 5 o'clock, goes home for the weekend, he's done. Doesn't have to pick up the phone anymore until Monday morning. But a slave's a slave always. And that's the way we are with Christ. Jesus does not give us the ability to clock out when we leave this building and clock in when we come back into this building. We are to serve him always. Now, a few, a few years later, Paul says these same things about Jesus. This time he's, in, or he's talking in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, and he says this about Christ, who ex Existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped or something to be held on to. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Praise God for the people who came out yesterday and helped build some frames for the building or for the Harvest Festival and for the guys. Tommy, I assume you're one of them that put the stripes in the parking lot. Thank you for that service. But imagine if God were to tell, tell you the service you're about to give me will result in the end of your life. How many of you would clock out and say, nah, I'm done. <laughs> Catch you next week. Some of you who know the histories of missionaries know that they were not always well liked. They struggled. What I'm trying to share with you here is both Matthew and Paul are saying the basically the same thing, that Jesus Christ entered into human history. He served us. By dying on the cross, among other ways. And now, if he is asking us to be a servant, it's only because he first served. And we need to use him as, in our, as our example. Now, Paul also reminds Timothy that Jesus rose from the dead. See, Jesus' resurrection was the culmination of our salvation. Now, don't ever think Paul's ignoring the, the cross here. Or when he's talking about the cross, doesn't mention the resurrection. He's ignoring that. That's not the way it is. 
Think about the cross and the resurrection as two sides of the same coin, okay? They are never far apart. Paul's telling Timothy, Jesus rose from the dead, having served us by dying on the cross for our salvation. Then Paul also tells Timothy that the gospel that Timothy heard was the gospel that Paul preached. Paul's basically saying to Timothy, you've heard me say this over and over and over again, that people need to to be servants because Christ first served us. This was Paul's gospel. We don't think about the gospel as telling us to serve, but it does. For we are to we are saved by grace through faith in Christ, and Christ is our example, therefore we are to serve. Not just within the church family, but in our neighborhoods, perhaps even in our own homes. The second truth that Paul promotes for effective service is his goal for his own suffering goal of Paul's suffering. Look with me at verses 9 and 10, please. For which I suffer to the point of being bound like a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. This is why I endure all things for the elect, so that they may, so that they also may obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. When Paul wrote this second letter, Timothy. Paul did not know if the sound, the next sounds that he heard would be that of Roman guards coming to take him away for his execution. Every four hours, his guard was changed. The new member of the Praetorian Guard, the the emperor's protective detail, kind of like our Secret Service, would be changed and he would be changed or chained to a new guard. <laughs> you think Paul took advantage of that? Oh, I guarantee it. Can you imagine Paul sitting there very humbly, very quiet, and in walks a Praetorian guard, the chains are taken off and put on the new guard so that Paul cannot escape and the door shut. Paul says, well, praise Jesus, let's talk about the Lord. And for the next four hours, that guard couldn't go anywhere, talking about a captive audience. I guarantee you Paul did that, no doubt in my, in my mind. I want you to see something here, for friends. Um, verse 10 says, this is why I endure all things for the elect. Okay, This term elect refers to men and women, boys and girls, who are um, either have already placed their faith in Christ or will at some point place their faith in Christ. The Lamb's Book of Life that Christ will read at some point and say, you know, Brad, your name's here in the Lamb's Book of Life. Welcome to glory. That Book of Life was written before the foundations of the universe were laid. God knows each one of us on whether or not we're going to give our life to Christ. And if you're going to be a Christian, whether you already are or going to be at some point in the future, your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, what a lot of people have done is they've taken this idea of elect and they've they've misunderstood it. Now, I'm not going to take the time in this sermon to chase this rabbit too far, but let me just let you know how I feel about it, okay? And what this word is telling us is is that God knows who's going to accept him and who will reject him. And those who accept him, their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You are part of the elect. Now, think about it in in this way, that if you are part of Christianity, then you are expected to do certain things. How many of you agree... By a show of hands, Christians are supposed to worship God. All right, some of you are still asleep because I didn't see hands, okay? All right, how many of you believe that Christians are supposed to read God's word, okay? All right, some of you just woke up, okay? You know, same thing about prayer, 
Same thing about service. Same thing about evangelism. We could go on from there. There are expectations that Christians are supposed to meet because we have entered into our relationship with God. And as part of the new kingdom, the kingdom of God, we're supposed to do certain things. That's what it means to be part of the elect. Okay? Um, I think we all should pause here for just a moment and ask ourselves, are we suffering for the work that God's called us to do? Some of us are. Some of us aren't. I don't think we should pursue suffering, but recognize when you're doing the job right, it's going to happen. Just be ready for it. Third truth here is our eternal reward. I want you to look with me at verses 11 through 13. This saying is trustworthy. For if we died with him, we also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny himself. thing I want you to hang your head on for just a few more moments here is this statement in verse 11. But if we died with him, we will also live with him. See, the Christian life is based on the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. If this is a, a repeated call for us to enter into the same type of relationship where we die to self, but live for God. Consider Luke 9, 23. If anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will save it. Or consider Galatians 2, 20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Or consider Romans 6, 1 through 5. What should we say then? Should we continue in sin so that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Or are you unaware that all who that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism unto death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. There are other passages that teach the same thing. The point is, is that Jesus died on the cross and rose to eternal life on Easter Sunday morning. And you and I enter into our own death when we accept Jesus' death on the cross as the sacrifice for our salvation. Now, obviously, we're not dead yet, but we continue to live in Christ. And what Christ is asking you and me to do is to serve one another, to be a servant here in the church house, to be a servant out in the community, to be a servant in your home, to serve others. And one of the ways that we serve others others by serving God is telling others about salvation in Jesus Christ. So I want you to close your eyes for just a moment. I've got a couple things I want you to want to ask you before we go into an invitation. Are you serving God at Elders Baptist Church? Because if you're not serving here, you're probably not serving in the community. 
Why don't you commit yourself today to looking for opportunities to, to be of service to God here in your church? And then also, are you serving out in the community? I'm not saying, I'm not talking about joining other organizations, though that's fine, nothing wrong with that. But are you looking for opportunities to minister to people who need to hear about Jesus? I don't want you to get up on a soapbox and start preaching somewhere. What I want you to do is kneel down before others and start wiping their feet. To be of service. And through that service, you'll gain opportunity to tell them about Jesus.